Well, all right, everybody. Come on, put your hands together. Help me welcome our online audience. Come on, let them hear you for a second or two. Come on. So great to bring you the word, really, uh, throughout our region and really throughout the United States. There's so many people, y'all, come to Destin, vacation here, and take a little bit of us with them back home. And uh, speaking of which, I want to encourage you, please download that Disciple Me app. I beg you to just share it with your next generation. Can I just take a moment and just kind of, I know Stephen would never say this, Pastor Stephen wouldn't, but the reality is that it just, it, it, it was heavy on his heart to teach this next generation this Bible. How many know that this Bible is filled with life? But at the same time, this Bible can seem sometimes intimidating. And Pastor Stephen, who happens to be my son, had it on his heart during COVID to sit in front of a camera and do seven minute videos throughout the whole Bible, unpack it simply and to take it home and to be able to just get people to not be intimidated by this, but to receive this. And he did that during COVID. And today we've got over 100,000 downloads of the Disciple Me. Come on. And young people, but it's not just for young people, okay? It's not just for young people. It's for us that want to just unpack a passage of Scripture and learn from the Word of God that is life-changing. Amen? All right, listen, speaking of the Word of God, open your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 3. Turn there or click there, but most importantly, get there. And uh, we're in a sermon series called Faith Works, as you can see behind me. And uh, we talked about it in week one. We talked about how we needed, our faith needs to discern the difference between tests, temptations, and trials. The reality is, is the devil will tempt you, not God. The truth is, is that the world will try you and God will test you. The temptations come so you can fall. The trials come so you can crumble, but you won't crumble in Jesus' name. Tests come so you can go to the next level. That's why you take tests in school, so you can be graduated and promoted. We need to understand that God tests us, the world tries us, and the devil tempts us, and understand that in our walk of faith. Last week, we talked about how faith works. We said works without faith is religious. We said faith without works is dead, but faith that has works is alive. And James is a straightforward book, and I love it when we do a book of the Bible once a year because it enables us to just kind of just capture the spirit of a writer and to see who he was talking to and why he was talking to them. And it was strong. And like I told you last week, the book of James was the last book to be canonized in the Bible because it was so strong and so, and so straightforward, especially last week's chapter of chapter two, which talked about faith and works. It seemed like he went against the grain of grace. I want to encourage you, go on our website, download our app, and just listen to all the messages and catch up and grow in the word. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about words of faith, words of faith. It's very simple message, but I believe a very powerful message because we need to be mindful of the words that we use and the words that come out of our mouth. Wouldn't you agree, everybody? Oh my goodness. We need to be mindful of it. And uh, before we get, dive into James three, let me just give you a very famous passage of scripture. Proverbs 18, 21, life and death are in the power of the, say it, or in the power of the tongue. And, and a lot of times we talk about what we say life-giving or something that's life-taking and death, but I really want to put an emphasis on the power of the tongue today and just give you this key quote. It's a simple key quote. It's with great power, come on, comes great responsibility. Now, who said that? Did James say that? No. Did Moses say that? No. Did David say that? No. Actually, it was Spider-Man's uncle that said this, by the way. <laughs> if you watch the movie, he discovered he had a superpower. But he was using it selfishly and carelessly to do some cage fights and make money. And his uncle said to him, he's like, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. How many of you have seen that movie? Let me see. Yeah, the rest of you need to get a life and watch that movie. It's a cool movie. I think it's pretty clean if my memory serves me right. But well, the reality is, you know what he's really saying? He's not saying anything different that the Bible doesn't tell us. And that the Bible has been telling us since the creation of man, watch what comes out of your mouth. Steward your words. I mean, that's all. Steward your words. What comes out of your mouth? Because with great power comes great responsibility. There's a great force that comes out of our mouth. By the way, this tongue is a superpower. 
God didn't give this to any animal or any plant. He gave it to you to watch what comes out of your mouth and the influence that it has. There's great power, great pressure. Anybody here pressure wash once in a while? I mean, you like to pressure? I love to pressure wash. You know why? Because it doesn't take much of a skill for me to just do It's mindless. It's the way I kind of decompress. I love to just pressure wash. Write my name, Steve, then erase it. Anybody do that? Yeah, don't answer. I mean, it's just, you're just, you're just chilling. I remember one day, man, I wasn't watching. And I about just drilled a hole in my big toe with that pressure washer. Because I was trying to get this one area that just was just had some grime and I was doing it bare with barefoot. And, and so I heard something. I looked up and down and went and pew. The pressure that was coming out of things, power. Look at me, the pressure that comes out of your mouth, the power, the force. Let me say it this way, the influence that you have. And James starts off right off the bat in chapter one. It seems like it doesn't apply, but I believe it does. And here it is, James 3, 1, as it comes up on the screen. Now, many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. In other words, how many know that, that someone like me, who is a pastor teacher, is going to be judged very strictly before I, when I stand before the Lord? Why? Because I, I need to be sharing the, the truth, the whole truth, come on, and nothing but the truth. And God's going to say, did you speak it in love, but did you share the whole truth? But let me just say this to you, because I think this is important. You don't have to hold an office of a teacher to teach. Just like you don't have to hold the office of a prophet to prophesy. And I thought about that for a moment and I realized this. I think what James is trying to capture our attention is this. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Because it comes out with a great force. It has great influence. Come on. It has great influence. And by the way, you'll give an account for it too. And I say that because I want us to be mindful with this incredible superpower, this incredible force, this pressure of power that can come out of our mouth because we are made in the image of God and God is mindful with what comes out of his mouth and we need to be mindful with what comes out of ours. And I thought about that for a second because because look at me, when you're talking, you're in some way, form or fashion, look at me, everyone, teaching. You're influencing. You're bringing people to some form of these three things as they come up on the screen. Write them down. Take a picture of them. It doesn't matter to me. You are going to influence people's decisions. You're going to influence people's direction. And you're going to influence people, unfortunately, in some kind of destruction if you're not mindful of what you say. Let me unpack it for you as it stays up on the screen. Many people are in the valley of decision. And you need to be careful with what you say because what you can say can cause them to take a wrong turn. So many people in the valley of decision. And, and, and James says, be careful because your tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. You can take them to go this, make this decision or that decision. I've always been careful as a pastor when I do counseling to be mindful of the counseling that I give, not the decisioning of people's lives. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to sit there and tell people what to do. I'm going to be mindful to give them the word of God and counsel them. But I'll tell you, I've never, ever, 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 ever told anyone to go get a divorce. I've been mindful to never say, well, you just need to divorce him. Or you just need to divorce him. I've never said that come out of my mouth. Why? Because that's not my decision to make. That's theirs. Are you hearing me today? Now, I'm going to counsel them. I'm going to tell a, a lady, hey, listen, you need to protect yourself if you don't feel safe, you know, all that stuff. I'm going to share. But I'm going to be careful. Why? Because I don't want people to look back over their life. I was, I was like, a, John was telling me after the first service, he was counseling somebody, and, and they were talking about how 
Man, that he was just, he was unfaithful and she, and, and, and she was thinking, I know biblically I have the grounds to divorce. But he said to her, he's like, what should I do? And she said, that's something you're going to have to study the scriptures and talk to the Lord. I know that you need to be careful and you need to be mindful. I know you need to forgive. I need you to, you know, seek the Lord. And he shared with her the word of God. And at the end of the day, she decided to forgive him and make a go with it. And 30 years later, they were still riding strong. And she was grateful that she stayed with her husband. Come on, somebody. Now, does it always work out like that? Nope. But I'm going to say this. We need to be mindful because we can influence people's decision. Yes or no? What about people's direction? He says the tongue is a rudder. Steers a whole ship. I remember Pastor Jordan coming up to me and saying, Pastor, I want to go plant a church. And I need to figure out where to go. My heart was Tallahassee. I just got done preaching for him in Tallahassee, but I wasn't going to tell him where to go. Why? Because he needs to seek God, hear from the Lord. I want to be careful of my influence. Now I said to him, he goes, I'm going to go visit five cities and see which one goes off in my heart. And here's what I said. You ready? I'm mindful. I said, would you make Tallahassee one of your five and pray about it? Seek the Lord. I mean, he went to Denver you know, I went to Orlando. I kind of like that, but I just like, uh, and I'd love to have a little church in Orlando I'd visit, you know, every other week or something. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, 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 and then, you know, then he went, and then he was going to go back to his hometown. I was like, whoa, that didn't work well for Jesus, man. I don't know if you should do that either. <laughs> but he was going to go to bed. You know what I'm saying? So I said, would you just consider Tallahassee? And he went to Tallahassee and said, God told me it's Tallahassee. And today, man, Five, six hundred people after five years. I'm talking generational. I mean, people seasoned, young people. He's just doing a fabulous job. It was his direction. Come on, somebody. It's his decision. And the Bible says, now you need to give great counsel, give the word of God. But we can be so quick and flippant and tell people what we think and what they should do. And James says, stop. You're going to get a hell to count on that. Let's not. Destruction. It says the tongue is a spark that can set a whole world on fire. And it tells us this. You ready for this? This is important. He tells us that be careful that you don't destroy the hopes of people's dreams. That you don't destroy the reputation of people with your gossip and your inside info. Be careful that you don't destroy someone's self-esteem with constant demeaning words. Come on, with great power comes great what? Responsibility. And James is telling us, be mindful of this. And so I just want you to see that. And so then he begins to unpack the power of this tongue and what the tongue does. So I want to give you these three words to fill in the blanks. Most importantly, ask the Lord to write them on your heart. Number one, the tongue makes us all, look at me, transparent. How do you know that the tongue tells on us? Of course it does. It tells on us. It tells on us. The reality is, is James would say this in James 3, 11. Can fresh water and salt water come from the same what? The answer is, the answer is, it's not a trick question. The answer is, no. The source of something, the taste of something is found in its source. Now check this out. The taste of something is found in its source. Jesus said it this way. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, will bring forth something good. Because the source and the spring and, you know, and the words are alike. Then an evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, will bring forth something evil. Then he said this in, in Luke 6, 45, the very next verse. For out of the abundance of the heart, come on, finish it with me, everybody. The mouth, what? The mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. And he says, by the way, your mouth will tell on you. Your mouth will reveal you. It will determine whether your, so- it reveals your source. Now, a lot of us, we don't know our own hearts. This is so important. Now, stay with me. Because Je- Jeremiah says, 
Jeremiah says, the heart is deceptive above all things. Who can know it? We can think our heart is clean and our heart is pure, but we don't really listen to what comes out of our mouth to realize, hey, something ain't right here in my in the spring because the, the water is not fresh. It's bitter. Am I making sense, everybody? And sometimes it takes somebody else because we love to hear ourselves talk, but we don't really hear ourselves talk. Come on. To realize that, wait a minute, there's something that is so not right in the source of my heart. It's always critical. It's always judgmental. It's never uplifting. It's always doubtful. It's constantly negative. And it takes somebody else a lot of times to be able to be honest with you. Come on. I know this. Uh, listen, I didn't really want to preach this message, to be honest with you. Because I know how I can be with my own tongue and with my own mouth. And it takes somebody else to be able to say, hey, what do I sound like? Or what do I predominantly sound like? Negative, judgmental, critical, correcting constantly? Or am I life-giving, encouraging? You know what? Let me show you a verse of Scripture that kind of spoke to me. It seems like it doesn't belong, but it does belong. Psalm 34, 8. Come on. Taste and see that what? Now, do you think God, is it, what does that mean? Because it can sound kind of weird to some people, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know what he's talking about? Tasting of his word. Now, is God's word fresh water or bitter water? Come on, say it again. It's fresh water. And, and when David said, taste and see that the Lord is, what's this last word, everybody? That's the source. That's the source. That God's source is always life-giving, hope-filled, encouraging. Even when it's corrective, it's got life behind it. It doesn't have condemnation behind it. If there's something powerful behind it, taste and see that the Lord is good. And in other words, when you read this and taste this, you're like, oh man, you're for me, not against me. The source of God is good. Now listen to me. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to dare you to do No. I'm going to double dare you, triple dog dare you, like in that movie, to go to your closest friend or your spouse and say this, what kind of taste do I leave in your mouth after our conversations? Because I'll tell you this, every time I leave my conversation with him, I feel so uplifted, so encouraged. Even when I, I'm corrected, I'm loved. Are you hearing me today? What kind of taste do you leave with people? Because I think it's important. And not only does the tongue reveal our hearts, look at me, it can reveal the hearts of others. Those that have that are the enemy of your soul. I'm going to be cautious with you, and I'm going to say this, though, because it's important, okay? There's social media and Facebook and Twitter and all this Instagram and everything, and all these extramarital affairs have all started, look at me, with emotional affairs with the internet. I can't tell you how many of our pastors and assistants are inundated with somebody cross the line. Everybody say, cross the line. Somebody crossed the line. And before they crossed the line physically, they crossed the line emotionally and they crossed the line conversationally. And they don't realize that they're being worked. Look at me, friends. Young people, hear me. They're being worked with words. And that's what I love about this. God has designed it not only for our hearts to be revealed, but for us to listen. And if we quicken our listening and say, Holy Spirit, help me not be, not be suspicious of what somebody says, but if somebody's crossing the line, 
carnally. Someone's crossing the line intimately, sharing something that they shouldn't be sharing with you. If someone is, is crossing the line from a compliment to a flattery and trying to work you, listen, be mindful because God has set it up for you to be able to hear the source of what might be coming against you. Does that make sense, everybody? I care about you and I care about what you hear. It's not just what you say, but what other people say. Let me show you a cool example. You ready for this? This is, uh, I don't know why it came to me, but it did. So here it is. Survey says, are you an Ephraimite? If you replied no, they said, all right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce the word correctly. They seized him and killed him when he tried to cross the fords at the Jordan. God has made it where you, if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, can hear when somebody is trying to work you, manipulate you, cross the line with you, want something from you, or try to destroy you or bring you down, if you're not mindful with, if, the, if, if you're sensitive to the spirit, you will hear the heart and the source. Is this all right, everybody? I say this to you because shibboleth now is really a, a military term, which means which side are you on? And I want people that are on my side, not somebody that wants to hurt me, but somebody that's an ally for me. I'll give you one more verse of scripture that's strong, but it's true. Because I told you that a lot of infidelity begins with words before it begins with touches. And here it is, Proverbs chapter 7, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her, come on, finish it with me, everybody, say it. It doesn't begin physically. It always begins conversationally. Somebody crosses the line. And if you're not listening carefully, you need to be mindful of it. Is this all right? You say, well, pastor, where do I get this gift? Just listen long enough. Oh, by the way, you can hear where people are from if you just would just take time to listen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean if I said, good day, mate. Well, where am I from? Yeah, you know, you know where I'm from. Adam Mills, our worship leader there in, uh, in uh, Fort Wall, Michigan, he opened up the service. Good day, mates. People know he ain't from here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, by the way, all these people that said shibboleth, it lets you know the environment that they were raised in. Come on, let me give you one more nugget. You ready? Just hit me while I'm talking to you. You ready? Your tongue is so transparent, it reveals the environment that you've been raised in and the environment you're hanging around in. Because let me just tell you something, foul mouth people make other people foul mouth. Pastor, now you're meddling. Well, you're welcome. Happy <laughs> September. I'm just telling you, it reveals the environment. You start cussing. You ask yourself, you know, like, like, you know, you clean up your act and, you, you know, Holy Spirit helps you. You're like, Where, where'd that cussing come from? Just, just listen to who you're hanging with. Listen to what's happening. You start talking sarcastically against the faith and putting things down biblically. Or, you know, all of a sudden you're like, I'm hanging around some people that are. You start getting negative and critical of your, of your boss. And all of a sudden you realize, I've been hanging around that break room a little too much. Because now what they're saying, come on, is coming out of my mouth. Let's move on because I feel a little resistance right here. <laughs> Number two, the tongue can be trained. We doing good, everybody? Yes, come on, the tongue must be trained. And there's two ways to train your tongue. I'm going to give you two verses of Scripture. One's in chapter 3, one's in chapter 1. All kinds of animals... Birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Remember that. No human being can, everybody say tame. Now remember that. No human being can tame the tongue. Now look at this in James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not, does not, say this word out loud, everybody, what? 
Say it again. Bridle his ass. Now, what is it, God? Do I, uh, is it tamed or is it bridled? It's both. And I'll explain it in a second. But deceives his own heart. This one man's religion is useless. I want you to write this key thought down. It explains it in one line. The tongue takes a higher authority and a personal responsibility. Explain that. No man can tame the tongue. We just read that, right, everybody? So that means you don't have it within you to tame your tongue. You need the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. That one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is the last one, by the way. It's self-control. You don't have it within you. You need the Holy Spirit to check you. That's why David would say, set a guard at the front of my mouth. Put a watch at the, at the post of the door of my lips. He would say, I need you, Holy Spirit, to help me. Why do we need a higher authority? Have you ever seen an animal train themselves? No. Ever get a puppy? How many of you have ever gotten a puppy? Let me see a puppy. You've had a puppy. Hey, did he potty train himself? No. No. No, no, no. They don't train themselves. It takes a higher, come on, authority. Well, let me ask you this. Do your kids train themselves? Train up a child, come on, in the way that he should. Okay, so in other words, it takes a parent to train a child. Okay, that should be a resounding yes in this house. They don't train themselves. You check them. You catch them. Are you catching this? You catch them. You check them. You, you see, and this is why you go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, today, I need you to tame my tongue. I need you to catch me. I need you to quicken me. Before that thing ever comes out of my mouth, the Holy Spirit, catch me, catch me. It's kind of like a mama who always catches their son, what they're about to do with one of those looks. You know what I'm saying? You give them the look and they're like, settle down, stop. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But by the way, you got to do your part. And that's to bridle your tongue. It takes the Holy Spirit to check you, a higher authority, but it takes a personal responsibility with you. And here's how you train your tongue. I'm going to give you three simple words. Write this down. Pause, ponder, purge. Pause. Pause. I got this out of one verse of scripture. Here it is in somewhere in James. Bring it up, would you? Bring up a James verse. <laughs> We're in James. Bring up a James verse. Here it is. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Say the next three words, everybody. And slow to become what? Now check this out. Because angry, human anger does not, what's the next word? Pro the righteousness that God desires. Now, I want you to see this. Go back to pause, ponder, and purge. Look at me. You know why we pause? We pause so we can be better listeners. Some of us in this room, when we see a yellow light, to us, it is code for, give it gas! How many of you are like that? Be honest in the house of God, because God knows and we'll see you anyways on 98. How many of you, when you see a yellow light, you give it gas? Let me see. Show your hand. Come on. There you go. Yeah, yeah. That's your personality. And look at me. That's your mouth. Don't get mad at me. I'm the same way. I told you I didn't want to preach this message. I'm ready to go. It's about the journey. No, it's not. I got places to go and I'm quick, but we need to, come on, say it out loud, everybody. Oh. There you have it, out of the mouth of babes. Hear me. We need to learn how to wait. Wait for someone to finish talking. Wait for someone to finish their thought. Not always be quick. 
Because this is important. Oh, by the way, you know what wait stands for? Why am I talking? Do you realize that when you're negotiating a deal, and I've negotiated a few in my life, I, 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 I don't go first. I got that part right. Well, what do you want for that? Why? Because the one that talks first loses. Wait. Everybody say pause. Number two, ponder. You know what James is telling us to ponder? Here it is. You ready? The outcome of this conversation. But it takes thinking with the end in mind. It says, do you realize that if you gaslight this thing and throw gas on this thing, that you're going to get angry? And the anger of God, the anger of man does not produce, come on, the righteousness of God. In other words, the end result is going to be something that will not benefit you. If you don't ponder what you're about to say, if you don't think how these words are going to land, come on, somebody. If you don't realize that this thing is going to shut this person down, this thing is going to steal that person's faith, that thing is going to demean that person's self if you don't want, but I'm right. You're going to be right, but you're, but in the end, the end result is you're going to end up on the couch. Ponder. I'm telling you, think. And last but not least, purge. Let me share something with you that's important because I think we all have areas of our mouth, Okay. Not our whole mouth, just a part of our mouth that has a, maybe an infection, constantly judgmental, negative, critical, harsh, unloving, not kind. Isaiah came to the Lord, check this out, in Isaiah 6. And when he got before the Lord, he said, woe is me, I'm undone because I am a man of, say the next two words out loud. Say it again. Do you realize that this incredible prophet that saw the cross in Isaiah 53, in Isaiah 53, came before the Lord and he said, Lord, there's a part of my language that is unclean. I don't know if he had a foul mouth. I don't know if he was just a prophet that was so judgmental. He had a prophetic edge to him, but he was, so prof- he was so prophetic. He didn't realize all he did was point everything out that's bad, nothing ever good. And he, I, I don't know. He just felt like there was something that wasn't clean and it didn't look like this. Come on. And the Bible says, because I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, I've been influenced. Come on. My environment has affected my speech. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Now check this out. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, thou hast touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is what? And here's the picture that I got. I want to share it with you the best I can. Have you ever heard of a medical procedure called cauterized Well, you take something hot and you burn off an infection. Antibiotics can't do it. Now we've got to burn something off. It burns, it it closes a wound where you're bleeding. And I felt like the Lord said, come before me and figure out where that infection is. Figure out where that, and let me show you where that bleeding is. And let me wholly cauterize your lips so they're no longer unclean, judgmental, foul, negative, fearful, condemning, demeaning. Because how many know that God, with his holy fire, doesn't want to consume us? He wants to consume that which hurts us. Come on, somebody. And that's the beauty of it. And he touched his lips. Lord, and I know my area. Can can I just be honest? I know mine. 
and look at me really good in these eyes. You know yours. And you can go to the Lord and say, would you cauterize this area of my life? I'm too argumentative. And I always have to be right. And that's destroying my relationships. It's not strengthening them. Are we good, everybody? Number three, last but not least, here it is, ready? The tongue is a tool. It's a tool for you to build something beautiful and build something constructive. It's a healing device. Check this out. The tongue of the wise, come on, finish it with me, everybody. Bring, say it. Brings what? Do we believe in this house in healing? Do we believe in this house in healing? Do we believe that God can heal physical bodies? Yes or no? Absolutely. Do we believe God can heal wounded souls? The Bible says with our hands, we can bring healing. Jesus said, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But that's not the only healing tool. Your tongue is a healing tool. The tongue of the wise brings healing. And if you would just be mindful to realize that this tool not only reveals our heart in a transparency, not only needs to be trained, it really does need to be used. Used in a way that brings healing to people. Friends, I'm telling you something, and I want to close with this. I want to be mindful of your time, but this is important. There are so many walking, wounded people. People that are sick, not in their bodies, but in their soul. They're just wounded. They're upbringing. They're upbringing their pain. Their father's words or lack thereof has shaped them and wounded them. They look like they have it all together, but they've been wounded. I'm one of them. I'm not ashamed to tell you. You know my plight. You know some of the things I've shared from this place. You know how I've, I've been wounded in my own heart. Pain with being told you're nothing but a disappointment. How do you recover with something like that? Even though you look like you got it all together. The truth is someone with healing in their tongue brings it and speaks it and makes somebody whole again. The tongue of the healing brings healing. The the tongue of the wise brings healing. There are so many walking wounded, but if we're too busy talking, we won't hear the pains of other people. We just got to say what's on our mind and we got to say it. Get it out. Go ahead. Isaiah, after he cleaned his mouth, I'm going to close with this. I promise you will see no other slide after this slide. (laughs) Isaiah 54, bring it up. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. This is the man who had an unclean tongue after God cauterized his mouth. He said, Lord, would you give me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary or wounded, to hear beyond what's on my mind, waken me morning by morning, let my ear hear as the learned. You know what he was saying in New Testament terms? Make me slow to speak, quick to listen, so I know how to bring healing to the walking wounded that you come across. If you would listen long enough, it don't take long to hear the pain of people that need the healing that you can bring. You can bring. You can bring. And you don't have to be an adult. You need to be a teenager, a young person. I remember one day in worship, I was struggling. We used to bring the kids forward to pray over them. And as kids were leaving, this one kid came up to me. I'll never forget, I just came to you while I was talking. 
I was at a real low point, you know? This one little girl was going to Gateway. She looked at me and she goes, you're strong. She walked off. I thought, oh, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Come on, stand to your feet, everybody, today.